Well, good afternoon, and it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me again, and thank you for the introduction reference, the introductory reference to Karl Rahner. Indeed, when I came to Innsbruck, he was not there anymore. He was just retired, but his spirit was every, everywhere, and he used to come to give lectures. So, um, and thank you for the reference to the social gospel, indeed. Those were the days when I studied theology, 69-73, when the interlinking of Jürgen Moldman, which was the great kind of uh, theologian with whom Meroslav studied, and Metz, the Catholic political theologian, and liberation theology, which was then emerging in Latin America, and how much, uh, basically, when I studied the social gospel, uh, the similarities, of course, are very, very great. Now, um, again, time is of the essence here. I don't have that much time to, I shouldn't waste time on these nice remarks. I should go directly to the uh, topic, namely, faiths as shapers of globalization. And of course, we can only take this seriously even if we have a very expansive conception of both, of globalization and of faith. If you have a very narrow definition of globalization, of course, it is irrelevant, the relationship. And especially if we also reduce faith. And I guess that's the interesting question, why faith and not religion? Perhaps because faith is a much more expansive concept that incorporates broadly culture and even the kind of unthought in, 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 in uh, um, Charles Taylor's sense of those things we take so much for granted that we do not even question them. They are simply unthinkable not to think through them. They think through us rather than we think in them. And in this respect, this is the kind of cultures. Uh, the question a Presbyterian atheist precisely, uh, the, the anecdote about Northern Ireland crossing from a Catholic to a Protestant, Hands up, where are you, Protestant, Catholic? No, I'm an atheist, but which one, a Protestant or a Catholic? Ultimately, yes, there is no such a thing as a secular person. There is no secular person in the abstract. Every secular is a post-Christian secular, a, a post-Catholic, a post-Calvinist, a post, so. But let's, let's begin first with the expansive conception of globalization. I don't know which kind of working definition you are using in this course. And according to this definition, when does globalization begin? I'm going to give you a very expansive definition. And I'm going to say there are three phases of globalization. The first phase is the original process of emigration of Homo sapiens out of Africa until Homo sapiens settles the entire globe. This is a phase in which you have the material base for globalization of a single humanity settling the entire globe, but no reflexive consciousness whatsoever. And only through DNA and other technologies we can reconstruct this process today. We know it happened. So this was the original phase of globalization. The second phase is consciousness without material base. And it takes place in the axial revolutions when simultaneously, you may have heard of the theory of Carl Jaspers, axiality, Simultaneously, and this is not that relevant, but it's interesting that around the same time, two, three centuries, you have simultaneously a breakthrough in the consciousness of humanity, of being able to somehow encounter or discover transcendence. The possibility of transcends one place, one's time, one society, and to think in universal terms. And so we have that people like Confucius, Buddha, Socrates, Plato, the Old Testament prophets, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Zoroaster, all of these are contemporaries. And all of those are the founders of our civilizations. And those are of what we call faiths, world religion civilizations. It's very important, of course, not all of them are religious transcendence. Plato, the Plato's conception of the allegory of the caves, the ideas, if you have a very expansive definition of religion as the sacred in a Durhamian sense, the way Robert Bella uses, then you say, of course, Platonic philosophy is a form of religion. It deals with the sacred. And indeed, it also offers a form of salvation to those who actually follow the ideas and this kind of philosophy. Confucius, you could say the Tao, there are elements of religion, but clearly it's not a religion in the sense in which we think of religion. Even Buddhism is not theistic per se. Obviously, the most clear concept of atheistic transcendence is with, with the monotheistic creator God, 
of the Old Testament. But the point is that here you have Confucius did not develop an ethic for Chinese. It was an ethic for humans. Socrates did not develop an ethic for Greeks. It was an ethic for humans. For them, there was no question. The, those were universal normal principles. And the God of Israel is the God of all peoples. And the same thing you could say about Buddha. So this moment when people conceptualize, anticipate, well before it is materially possible, the possibility of one single global humanity sharing, if you wish, the same time and space, the same consciousness, the same norms. This is really the anticipatory phase of globalization that only becomes then materially possible realized in our age, our age of globalization. But it may not have been possible without the others. And now here you enter into, we know that in terms of if the process of expansion of uh, uh, populations with the first migrations was material, the second one already, the expansion of Christianity beyond the Middle East, of Buddhism beyond India, of all of those uh, spreads of these uh, faiths that become transnational, transpolitical, trans empires. Again, they are still very much embedded in material imperial civilizations, but they all of them have the possibility of transcendence. The Pope, the Bishop of Rome, always claimed to speak urbi et orbe, to the city and to the globe. Of course, this was never a reality until the second half of the 20th century, but now it has become a reality. And this is what every world religion can do today. The same one claiming we are this unique, very particularistic faith, at the same time claiming we are the best faith for all of humanity. And all of them do that. The interesting dynamic going on today is the way in which each of the faiths claims at the same time to be unique and different, and they want to preserve this unique difference vis-a-vis -vis the others, at the same time claiming somehow that they are a universal response for all of humanity. And this is where the very interesting dynamics of globalization and faith then enters. How this globalization, this process of this consciousness that we all share the same space and the same time, affects then these faiths that were until now territorially delimited to particular and demographically delimited to particular areas of in particular groups of the population. And the process whereby today all of them can become deterritorialized and become sort of global faiths at large. You may be familiar with the, the title of uh, Arjuna Padurai, Modernity at Large. Well, global religions at large. That's what each religion is becoming today. And, the, and I would argue we are in a moment of global denominationalism, where a process of mutual recognition of all the faiths, uh, both accepting the differences between the faiths, and yet trying to claim the shared commonality of the faiths. This, a lot of conflict takes place in this process of recognition. It's not necessarily only interfaith religious dialogue. Sometimes it is a very nasty conflict that this recognition takes place. So this is one very aspect of the dynamic of globalization and faiths which are interlinked today. The other, of course, has to do with the question of how each of these faiths then itself shapes the particular form of modernity. If you have followed my essay, the claim is that the secular begins first as a Christian theological category. It's part of a Christian theological conception of the cosmos, of the universe of reality. And precisely because of that, the analytical transformation of Christianity can be understood as a process of secularization. It's a very unique uh, Christian uh, dynamic that could not be reproduced anywhere in the world. What is wrong with the thesis of secularization as it was developed by the Enlightenment was the notion that this process of Christian secularization is part of a global universal process of transition from religion to non-religion. There was primitive religion at the time and then there will be no religion after. So this freeing oneself from religion. So it, it generalizes one process of, if you wish, deconfessionalizing Christianity and creating a kind of Christian culture without churches which is what very much the process of, 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 of Western modernization may said to be. And how then this, however, this particular Western process, which is uniquely Christian, and when I say Christian, I'm, I would even say Western Christian. There is no concept of the seculum in Eastern Christianity, in Byzantium. It's only 
a Western Christian concept. And because of that, only where you have this concept, you can actually have a dynamic of secularization. And what is this dynamic? The dynamic is to eliminate, to solve the dualism between the religious and the secular. The religious which is represented in the monasteries and the seculum in the world. And the whole process has always two logics. One, to get rid of the walls by bringing the religion into the seculum, transforming the seculum according to Christian principles. To try to transform reality according to Christian principles. This is one of the dynamics of secularization. This is what Luther did. Let's all be monks in the world. Let's not be monks in the monastery. Let's all be monks in the world. And so this is the Protestant model of precisely eliminate, not so much eliminating uh, or maintaining the boundaries and keeping religion separated, but really almost eliminating the boundaries or diffusing the boundaries by making the religious secular and the secular religious. So then again, you can be a secular Presbyterian and it's not clear what is secular and what is Presbyterian in this mixture. And this is why for Europeans it's so difficult to understand what religion in America is because indeed, it is so secular that it doesn't count as religion as anymore as most Europeans tend to, tend to say about American religion. But there is another model, which is the dynamic of getting rid of the priest, of get, getting rid of clerical ecclesiastical institutions, the dynamic of laicism, and to, to create secular structures which are not anymore under the control of religious authority. So it is these two dynamics, eliminate the separation, and, but then the secular is not what remains that was always there after you get rid of this superstructure, which is religion. We must get rid of this notion that the secular is really the authentic human, which is there. And you only have to get rid of this thing that somehow was added to us, religion, which is not really natural, was this supernatural thing added. And once you get rid of it, the natural human secular remains. No, the secular is a construction. It's a construction, and this is, of course, the great thesis of, of Charles Taylor, and it shows how much our Christian, our secular, Western secular, is how Christian it is. Uh, how much it is permeated by notions of love, agape, the whole notion of solidarity, and uh, we could go on through uh, different types of cultural conceptions and to see how much they are linked to Christian uh, norms, values. But, of course, we know that this particular dynamic which for whatever reasons uh, develops out of the West, is linked to the process of global colonial expansion of European powers, and then becomes globalized. But then becomes globalized in a way that enters in dynamic encounters with other civilizations, other faiths, which have a different way of establishing these boundaries between transcendent and immanent, sacred, profane, religious, secular. And, and sometimes we take these parallel terms, this binary, immanent transcendence, uh, profane, sacred, secular religious, as if they will be synonymous, they are not. They correspond to different ways of classifying those things. And it's not clear what is the broader concept and how they fit within one another. That's why many of our problems dealing with these concepts is the relation precisely between what is sacred and profane. It's very clear that prior to the axial ages, the sacred and profane both were immanent. Then emerges transcendence, but transcendence doesn't need to be religious. And we have the secular today, but the secular is not profane. The secular can be very sacred, sacred nationhood, sacred citizenship, sacred science. So it is simply that the categories we have do not help us to try to conceptualize all these things. And of course, it is because of our secularist narrow conceptions that sometimes we have no way of dealing with those issues. But then the question is, OK, and of course one could argue even the attempt to argue that even Christian developments were innerly separate Christian developments. We know that this is not true, that the very Christian developments cannot be understood without the links with Judaism and with Islam, and that these themselves are linked to. So all these civilizations never were clearly territorially separated boundaries. They were always encounters. They were always hybrids. And none of them can be understood in its own terms. And again, faith, when we talk of faith, how do we separate the Christian, the religious Christian from the secular Christian? The whole debates in Europe today, whether Turkey should belong to Europe or not, is precisely about that, the difficulties of defining Europe. 
Obviously, you cannot define it in religious terms as Christian Europe, because half of Europeans say, but I'm not Christian. You cannot define it purely as secular, because, because then you have a lot of Christians still in Europe which are not secular. And the whole problem about Turkey is that precisely it's neither Christian nor secular. But it's Muslim, and it meets all the criteria of democracy, the rules which the European Union has basically established for entering the Union. But then the whole issue of what is this culture? What are we? Who are we Europeans vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world? Well, we have these human rights. But human rights are universal rights, not European rights. So the whole issue of how do we define ourselves vis-a-vis -vis other cultures? What is this faith, European faith? What is the system of European faith that distinguishes Europeans from others, and which is what is the, the, the kind of criteria to let people in or keep them out? Those are very kind of dif uh, difficult issues. And we are in the process today in the world in which all these civilizations are coming to terms and are encountering one another. Uh, Darwin was mentioned. Obviously, we are at a kind of paradoxical moment in which we humans, as a species, has come to recognize our single humanity, our history, if you wish, as one process of evolution. But of course, the, the theory was one of random evolution, which works until culture enters in. We know that one's history, one culture takes over, is not so random anymore. There is a different process of human evolution, which is cultural evolution, which is very much linked to religion. And the interesting question is that we are in the moment now in which both we can, for the first time, if you wish, write a collective autobiography of how we got here, how we all have become one single global humanity, with very diverse, precisely multiple humanities or multiple types of being human. In the same time, we are at the moment in which we could simply self-destroy ourselves or try to precisely end evolution, random evolution, and try to direct it through scientific management or simply, you know, how to destroy ourselves, the environment in which we live. Those are the kind of questions that globalization raises also. It's not only a question about, obviously, economic development. But it is this awareness that the very same moment when we have become really one single global humanity sharing world history, uh, we are now somehow uh, responsible for the next phase of globalization. And we'll have to somehow all come together to decide how do we do it. And I think that the model of a kind of a cosmopolitan secularism that we in the West knew that the rest of the world is going to become like us is not viable anymore. And that we have to let all faiths, if you will, of humanity come in and uh, together come to, term, come to terms with our past, how we got here where we are now, and how we are going to construct our future together. Thank you.